Welcome to the Insurgent Podcast with Frank Viola. And he's brought a friend. This is the podcast that supplements Frank's groundbreaking book, Insurgents, Reclaiming the Gospel of the Kingdom, which is shaking up the Christian world. You can find out details about the book at insurgents.org. Sit back, open all four ears, physical and spiritual, and join the insurgents. Here's Frank. Welcome to another edition of the Insurgents Podcast. And today we're going to do something a little bit different. If you have been listening to the podcast from the beginning, I have had five different conversation partners on the show. First, we had John Nugent. Then we had Denzel, our beloved Denzel. We had Michael Heiser, who unfortunately has passed into glory. Fortunate for him, but unfortunate for us. And that took place very recently. But I'm so glad that he became a friend and he was a conversation partner on this show. And we talked about spiritual warfare in several episodes. And then we had Nicholas. And then we had Brian. And today we have a sixth conversation partner. And his name is Tim Oslovich. I call him Timbo. Good to see you, Tim. Great to be here, Frank. Always great to see you. I feel the same. And we are in Orlando, Florida. We just ended four days of an intensive mastermind with a group of Christian leaders who flew here from different states in the country, and they descended on this same hotel where we're sitting right now. And uh, I was just sharing with Tim what we did. We spent four days together from morning until evening with breaks in between, of course, and we learned how to encounter the Lord Jesus together, and we did encounter him, and the things we did were so encouraging, and all of these leaders have wonderful testimonials about the weekend. The Lord was really merciful to us, very gracious to us, so kind to us. And it was unlike anything these leaders had ever been to, Tim. One of the comments that came forth repeatedly was that so many of them, and some of them are lead pastors, had been to so many conferences, so many workshops, so many cohorts, but nothing like what we experienced. And if you're interested at all, I would encourage you to go to this website, ministrymind.org, all one word, ministrymind.org, and that will take you to the page. The mastermind is called The Insurgents Experience. We only invite those who apply. In the application, it only takes a minute or two, (laughs) so it's not a long, drawn-out application form. It's very simple. You were part of a mastermind. It was a little different. It wasn't as intense. It was the precursor (laughs) to this weekend. But you have memories of what that was like. Absolutely. Back in 2016, uh, a bunch of us gathered. And that was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. It was was a transforming experience, I think, for all of us that Mm -hmm. were there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the spiritual practices, the, the conversations, the times in prayer, the times in fellowship with the Lord just different than any of the ordinary conferences or workshops that that pastors tend to go to different focus focus more on the internal work that god is doing in us and that's uh that's vital i mean it's vital stuff so i'm glad that i'm glad that you not only that you're continuing but that it's getting better and better yeah it, it is and it's getting longer and we touch on everything from struggles to ministry to the the root behind ministry, the engine that drives it, to the secret to not burning out, and to the secrets of impacting people with Jesus Christ. So yeah, it's been wonderful. I'm so grateful and privileged and honored to be able to host these events. 
these masterminds. So yeah, if you're interested, ministrymind.org. And you just heard from a lead pastor <laughs> uh, give that testimonial. It's not just for lead pastors. It's for anybody who is in the business of preaching and teaching. And businesses in quotes, folks, meaning you preach and or teach. Okay, now we are going to continue this project of looking at and discussing every reference to the kingdom of God in the Gospels. And it's been a pretty tall project because there are a lot of references in the Gospels. And I don't know if we're even halfway through. I'm not sure exactly where we're at. But we do know that there are over 80 references in the Gospels. And once we finish with this, Tim, we're going to move on to the book of Acts all the references to the kingdom there, and then we're going to go through the epistles until we get to that very mysterious book that only one person can unlock, and I'm sitting next to him right now. He is an expert on the book of Revelation. But we we won't talk about that, Tim, uh, today. So (laughs) I say that that facetiously. Uh, Do you understand the book of Revelation? No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a friend who who made the statement that there are only three people in the universe who understand the book of Revelation, and that is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and even they don't agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the passage is Matthew 16, verses 13 to 20. I'll go ahead and read that out of the... English Standard Version. I just heard all of our Reformed brothers and sisters cheer. The ESV. And the passage begins with verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they, meaning his disciples, said, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he, Jesus, said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ or the Messiah. And, of course, the reference to the kingdom is in verse 19, the keys of the kingdom. And the ESV has a few notes here. In verse 18, when Jesus says, you are Peter and on this rock, the note says, the Greek words for Peter and rock sound similar. And then in verse 18, the gates of hell, the Greek is the gates of Hades. I'm just going to kick off here, Tim, and there's a lot here. (laughs) I think we could talk for a long time. (laughs) There is a lot here. There's a lot here. I guess the first thing I want to say is, in this passage, we have true confessions, and we have a church on the rocks. (laughs) And the Lord Jesus Christ is a builder. He says, I will build my church. He is a builder. Psalm 1. 27, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. And boy, I think any Christian who has been around for any length of time can well discern that some buildings, so to speak, was not the Lord's house that the Lord built. And the laborers were laboring in vain. And that's a a warning for all of us who labor in God's vineyard that unless it's the Lord doing it, our toil is in vain and our efforts will be wasted. But while the Lord builds the house, he uses men. 
he uses humans. Even though Jesus is the builder, he uses people like Paul. Paul said he was a master builder of himself, 1 Corinthians 3. But what is this rock that Jesus is building his church on? And this is a big question, and I'll share a little bit about how I view this, and (laughs) I want to hear your input here, Tim. I personally believe that the rock is the confession that Peter made that Jesus of Nazareth was the anointed one, the promised Messiah, the Christ, and the Son of the living God. And we'll get into what the Son of the living God means um, because there's history behind that, going back to the Hebrew Scriptures. It's that confession, but that confession wasn't just an articulation that reflected mental assent. You know, Peter wasn't just reciting some creed mindlessly. Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. My Father revealed it to you. It was a revelation. So the rock that Jesus builds on is, in my view, the confession. Uh, I'm thinking of Romans 10. You know, unless you believe in your heart, well, you're not going to believe unless it's revealed to you that what you are believing is in fact true. And confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, right? You will not be saved. Uh, This is how you become saved. This is how you become a stone in the temple that God is building. And Peter was the first one to do that publicly. He was the first one to open his mouth and give expression to that revelation that God the Father had shown him that Jesus, in fact, was the promised Messiah. And by making that confession, Peter becomes the first living stone in the Lord's house. And by the way, Peter will use that exact language in his letter. (laughs) We're all living stones. So apologies to the Roman Catholic Church. Peter is not the only person. He's not the only stone that Jesus builds his church on. He probably is the first, though. That's what I would say, too, Frank. I would say it's a both and, right? It's not a, you know, like you said, in the in the Roman Catholic Church, this text is where the papacy gets established, right? So Peter is the one, he's the one that gets the keys, and then he passes them down the line. And, of course, for many, for many of us in the Protestant tradition, it's the confession. That's it. Peter doesn't matter. It's the confession. <laughs> right, right, right. But it's a both hand. I mean, it's Peter is the first rock. And, and, and that's the, that's the word play there, right? Petros is the Petra. You know, we have the Petros, Peter, the, the masculine. He's a, a man. He's a real human being that has this confession. And then he makes that confession. That confession is the thing that's, that's transformative. And it's passed on. He's the first rock. But then there are more rocks. Yes. Matthew 18, right? The same language is in Matthew 18 of binding and losing. And that's passed on to the disciples and the church. That's how the kingdom expands. It expands, you know, as you said earlier, God uses human beings mm. to expand it. Amen. Amen. Very good. And there's another passage in Ephesians 2 that the ecclesia, and Paul uses the image of the temple, okay? to describe the Ecclesia is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Well, those apostles and those prophets lay the foundation of Jesus Christ. And that temple is built on that foundation. But that foundation, when we say Christ is the foundation, that could be made into some abstract, metaphysical, mindless, theological tenet. Here we get an insight into what it really means. The Father, through the Holy Spirit, reveals, opens the eyes, gives an unveiling to a human being that this person, who we call Jesus, is in fact Lord of the world, Messiah of the world, the Christ of Israel, the King of the entire planet, and it is a revelation. We see that. It comes to the heart. 
it's something that a person believes to the point of being willing to die for it. And out of that revelation comes this confession. And therein you have the foundation of the church. The Christ is the foundation, but it is the revealing of him and the confessing of who he is that makes one a living stone in that grand temple. The confession, the revelation, and Peter himself being the first one to do so makes up the first living stone in this temple, the ecclesia. And when he says, Jesus now, on this rock I will build my church, he follows it up with the gates of hell or the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, let's talk about the gates of Hades. This is referring to the realm of the dead. All right. And it's interesting that Caesarea Philippi, where this scene is taking place, it's a city north of the Sea of Galilee, and it's at the base of the southwest slope of Mount Hermon. And Mount Hermon was considered the gateway to the realm of the dead. So it's fascinating where this is taking place. And it was long associated with pagan worship in the north part of Bashan, which is known as the place of the serpent. Now, what I see here, and this is unfolded through history, even beginning in the book of Acts, is you have the kingdom of God, the kingdom community, the ecclesia, advancing in the earth, right? Starts in Jerusalem, then it spreads into Samaria, then it moves into the Gentile world, and it's pushing ahead. And as it's doing it, the kingdom of darkness, whose major tool is death, both physical death and spiritual death, is coming against it. And when Jesus says the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, gates are defensive structures. So the image is the kingdom is pushing forward. The church of a living God is advancing, spreading, and the fury of Hades, the fury of the serpent, the fury of hell is coming out against it to try to decimate it. But the promise of Jesus is that it will not be thwarted. It will not be thwarted. It will not prevail and destroy the ecclesia. And we can see this throughout history. You can see it in the book of Acts. You can see it in the subsequent centuries. Every time the church of the living God, the body of Christ, was persecuted, fallen men motivated by demon spirits were seeking to bring death in all forms against it, it continued to prevail. It may have gone under for a while, but it always came back. It could not hinder it. The kingdom of God is an expanding reality. And, and like you said, the, the forces of darkness in the world, the forces of death and sin and evil are in retreat. It doesn't always look that way mm. to us. To us, and especially, you know, especially if you pay too much attention to the media, everything is always getting worse. But the, but the deeper reality is the kingdom of God is advancing. The kingdom of heaven is advancing. The gates of death cannot stop it mm. from permeating throughout the whole world, from bringing life to as many people as possible. Mm. And like you said, this, is a, this, is a, this confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, is an acknowledgment of... Of Christ as King and that kingdom expanding. Mm, mm. It's not just a simple intellectual assent, like you said. This is not just a doctrine. Mm -hmm. This is a this is a life transforming reality mm. that for Peter and for those and for those first disciples made everything different. And, and I think one of the reasons that Jesus goes to Caesarea Philippi. You know, there's that piece about it being at the foot of Mount Hermon and the, the entrance to the to the realm of the dead. But Caesarea Philippi is also the city that Herod Philip built to honor Caesar, mm. who is the god of that age, wow. who is the who is the bringer mm. of death to those who would oppose him. Mm. Right, so. Herod Philip builds it to honor Caesar and to honor himself, one of these fake Roman propped up kings. Right. 
And Jesus comes there and says, well, there's a new king in town. Mm. The, the kingdom is advancing, you know, not just in the, in the spiritual realm, but in the political realm mm. as well. Mm. That this is a real world effect that's happening. And it starts off with, it starts off with just Peter, right? It starts off mm. small, but the stones start building yes. and building mm. and building. And it is unstoppable. That's good. The gates of Hades representing the realm of the dead. Death really is the chief enemy of the Ecclesia. It's the last enemy. And it is the greatest enemy that God has ever had. Death. And that's not just physical death, but it's death in every area. You know, there's spiritual death. There is a death that comes to God's children emotionally, mentally, all coming from that other realm, not talking about the heavenly realm, but the under realm, the realm where the enemy operates. But the good news is that death in whatever form cannot stop God's ecclesia, God's kingdom. In fact, historically, the seed of the martyrs was the germ that multiplied the church, the ecclesia. Tertullian, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. We see that Hades does stand for death, even in the Old Testament. You have the passage in Isaiah 38, verse 10. In the prime of my life must I go through the gates of death and be robbed of the rest of my years. Sheol and Hades refer to the same thing. The realm of the dead. Uh, Job 17, 16. Will it go down to the gates of death? Will we descend together into the dust? Well, the point here is that death will not eliminate the assembly of God. And I'm not talking about the denomination. <laughs> I'm talking about the ecclesia, the temple of God, the kingdom of God on the earth. And it pushes past the gates of death. And they will not stop it. So it's really a victorious promise. And I think it comes in handy when... There is a kingdom community locally that is meeting under the headship of Christ, that's standing for God's kingdom, that's standing for the lordship of Jesus, that's declaring that gospel of the kingdom, because the promise is that the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, the gates of Sheol shall not stop it. We can exercise faith in that promise. Yes, because Jesus continues to be with us and Jesus has entrusted us with the keys. Yes, yes. He's entrusted us with the keys so that we, through Christ, have that power to do the binding and loosing. Mm. And, I, and I think really the biggest part of that, I think there's several levels to that, but I, for me the biggest part of that is that through the ecclesia, through the body of Christ in the world, mm. Those forces of evil and darkness get bound so that they cannot destroy the church that God is building, the church that Christ mm. is building. Mm. Uh, Mark 3, where Jesus talks about binding the strong man so that his house can be plundered, right? Jesus comes, he binds the strong yes, man, he, he binds Amen. Satan, but then he gives the church the power to continue that work because yes. there still are forces of evil in the world. Yes, very it, good. The, the victory is won. But there's still, there's still a cleanup operation going yes, on. Yes, very good. And Jesus entrusts us as the, as the little rocks that he's using to build the church with those keys to do the binding and to do the loosing, the loosing of setting people free from those burdens, mm -hmm. from those burdens bringing forgiveness, bringing reconciliation, bringing the power mm -hmm. of the living God into people's lives so that they know that transformation, so that then they can make that confession. Then mm. they become mm. one more rock in that church that Christ is the one who's building. Mm. Well, I like that you pointed out that Jesus was the one who bound the enemy. And we did a podcast episode in the Insurgents podcast on that whole passage because it's fascinating that in that very context, Jesus was literally binding the enemy in that scene where he makes that statement. And we now can stand 
in faith on the ground that he has bound the enemy. Mm -hmm. And so wherever we see the powers of darkness operating, we can take that stand that the enemy does not have power. Jesus has disarmed them. And the only power the enemy has is power we give him. Mm. He has no power other than that, mm. you know, because he has already been bound and defeated. Let's talk more about the keys of the kingdom. You mentioned that, and I'll double click on everything you said there. It's clear from this passage that kingdom and church, kingdom and ecclesia are connected. Peter is given these keys here, and I think in the book of Acts, if we ask ourselves, well, when did he use these keys? We can see one instance where he used them in Acts 2, where he opens the door <laughs> to the Jews, mm. and they come into the kingdom, those who responded to the message. And then later in Acts chapter 10, he uses the keys again to open the door to the Gentiles. And who's doing this? Peter, the first one to make the confession, right? Mm. Which is the rock upon which Jesus built his church. So he unlocked the kingdom to both Jew and Gentile. But he, as you pointed out, he represents all who proclaim the gospel of the kingdom because Paul also used the keys to the kingdom to open up God's reign, God's realm, God's sovereign alternative civilization, the kingdom to the Gentile world. Philip used the keys to open the kingdom to the Samaritans. So it wasn't just Peter. And what do keys do? They open and close. They lock and unlock. The word bind means to lock or prohibit. The word loose means to unlock or permit. My understanding is that the Jews conceived the word bind to mean to make something obligatory. Hmm. And loose meant to make something optional. And so this is yet another aspect of this binding and loosing, this opening and closing. Here the ecclesia is being given the power to open the doors of the kingdom and even the forgiveness of Christ to others through the preaching of the gospel. It's given the moral authority to interpret God's will in a local body of believers. And I think this becomes clearer in Matthew 18 when mm. he uses the keys of the kingdom, but we'll look at that in a few minutes. But a local body of believers that assembles together under Christ has tremendous authority. It has tremendous authority to open and close the kingdom of God to others, but it also has tremendous authority to exercise God's judgment. An example that comes to mind is Peter when he confronts Ananias and Sapphira. What they did was they lied to the community. They lied to the ecclesia. But Peter says, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. Mm. And unfortunately, the judgment of God fell on them. Why don't we look at Matthew 18 here? Because it is relevant to uh, several of the points you made, Tim, concerning who the keys were given to, <laughs> not just Peter. In Matthew 18... And we'll look at verse 15. I'll read it from the New King James. We'll do a little differently. <laughs> Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the ecclesia. But if he refuses even to hear the ecclesia, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. So here he's talking to all the disciples. When he says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And he's not, he's not just talking to the disciples. He's saying any local ecclesia, right? So apologies to the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> the keys are not just given to Peter, 
right? And here he's talking about disciplining a member of the kingdom community who refuses after continuous efforts to cause them to repent, to persuade them to repent, to be restored. He gives them the authority to, in effect, excommunicate them, to put them out of the assembly. Again, I see this binding and loosing as having multiple aspects to it, multiple applications to it, but one of them is to interpret the will of God and to bring it to pass in a way where an ecclesia who truly is under the headship of Christ, the kingship of Christ, can make a decision and heaven will stand with that decision. Of course, the decision is within the will of God. It's not just, you know, blab it and grab it, name it and claim mm-hmm. it. It's it's within God's will. But if it is within the realm of God's will, heaven will stand with the declaration of the church, a local church in a given situation. Yes, that the, that the binding and loosing is also a means of building up and preserving the community. Yes. Right. You, it, you can't have a community, you can't have a, uh, an ecclesia where anything goes. That doesn't work. Right. That will fall apart. So you need you need tools to be able to to be able to deal with conflict, to be able to deal with somebody yeah. who's doing something that's clearly egregious and 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 destructive. So Jesus says there are there are ways to do this, and there's a procedure for it. Mm. And if the offender is completely unrepentant and unwilling to take any correction, even from the body as a whole, then what do you do? There has to be some way to preserve the community. Mm -hmm. The community can't just fall apart because one person wants to tear it down. Mm -hmm. That makes it possible to preserve the community by saying, you're not not part of this anymore. Mm -hmm. And yet, and yet, the, the amazing thing that Jesus says next is, let that person be like a Gentile or a tax collector. Mm. And of course, what does Jesus do with Gentiles and tax collectors? He continues to call them to repentance. Mm-hmm. He continues to invite them into the presence yeah. of the living God. He continues to try to unlock, right? He continues mm. to try to unlock that darkness that's holding mm. somebody back. Mm. And, you know, I think sometimes we, we, we read that and it's like, ooh, well, this is really mean and really punishing. And No, mm. this is not mean and punishing. This is preserving the community, mm-hmm. preserving the, the people who are, who are part of right. that ecclesia, and also then acting toward that person who's trying, to break, who's trying to break the body in a way that makes it possible for them to still break free from whatever is holding them back. Yes. In fact, in many ways, putting a person out of the fellowship when everything else has failed and they continue to refuse to hear the body of Christ, Jesus Christ speaking through his body. And just let me insert here, when he is saying, first, tell the person in private, which is very important, right? That can be done multiple times. It's not just one time. Well, right. we did it. We did it once. We warned you, Tim, once. Well, now let's get two or three. Hmm. I'm just waiting for the time we can throw them out. Throw the rascal out. We're going to just do the one, two, three, and you're gone. Strike out. Sit down. That's, that's not the spirit here. The spirit right. is you continue. Two or three. It could be numerous times where you take two or three. Maybe you take two. Maybe you take three on the second round. You're trying to exhaust... All that you can do to bring this person to repentance, because whatever they're doing, it's hurting the community. Paul said, a little leaven, you let that leaven stay, it's going to corrupt the whole lump. And he was talking about the same issue, you know, put this person out. The Corinthian church went on the other side of it. The Corinthian church fell on the other side of the horse, and they were rejoicing even though there was someone in the assembly that was wreaking havoc and they were just okay with it. 
And Paul had to be strong, and basically he was repeating what Jesus said. This is in 1 Corinthians 5, if you want to look at it. But then he says, so that, and I'm paraphrasing here, so that this person's out of the protection of the assembly, the spiritual protection, and they will, in effect, come to repentance. And I have watched this happen. I have watched, to their credit, uh, a local assembly be so patient with a person who was unwilling to repent to the point where it was told to the whole church. And by the way, folks, whole church does not mean all the Christians in the world. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about a local assembly that knows this person, the local body of believers that has a responsibility to this person because the person is in the life of the assembly, right? This is not speaking out of school. It's Brother Jed or Sister Sally. They've been meeting with us. They've been gathering with us. And there's been a problem. And so we've gone to them in person. In person. Not through a text and not through an email or a Facebook message or an Instagram message or a LinkedIn message. No, we've we've sat down with this person and tried to persuade them to stop what they were doing because not only it dishonors the Lord, but it's hurting the community. And I've watched this process take place. It wasn't just one, two, three, you're out. It was a lot longer. And finally, there had to be that decision. And it was done in such a way not to shame the person, Hmm. right? Not to self-righteously look down their noses and, oh, did you hear what Joe did? It wasn't like that at all. It was a grieving process. But in two cases, the two cases I can think of, the Joe and the Sally came back to the Lord and was restored to the Mm. community. Right. So that's the goal of it. Right. (laughs) It's to bring them to a a restorative relationship. Yes. And that's, in in my mind, that's clearly what what the text says. And is one more example or one more way that the power of the confession gets played out in the church and in the world mm. right that it's because it's because Jesus is the Christ the son of the living god that Jesus is the true king mm. he is the king of mercy and reconciliation and that gets played out and that's who our king is mm. and then we're going to act in certain ways mm-hmm. right it, we're not going to act in the whatever goes goes way mm. because at the end of the day that's not loving is it it really isn't right right that's right that's right amen getting back to peter's confession you are the christ christ of course means messiah and messiah means king messiah the anointed one kings were anointed And he was the king, and we know this because he's the promised ruler in Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now, this is a reference to Jesus prophetically and in psalm chapter 2 verse 7 psalm 2 verse 7 from the new international version i will proclaim the decree of the lord he said to me you are my son today i have become your father yeah so the son of god the messiah it's all references to jesus as king and that's in effect what Peter was saying. He was saying, you are the king. He, he was also saying, you are the Lord of the world because the Messiah of Israel was to be the Lord of the world also. This brings us back to the everlasting domain, the kingdom of God. I'm also impressed with the fact that Peter in Aramaic is Cephas, and it means a stone. And as we said, he is the beginning, (laughs) Uh, the first stone, if you will, in the temple that Jesus is building. Now, the temple in the Old Testament was an overlap between heaven and earth. 
And Jesus is the embodiment of the temple. And in him, you have an overlap of heaven and earth. And then the ecclesia, his body, it literally is his body on earth, is also an overlap of heaven and earth. And this is one of the reasons why there is such authority in the ecclesia, hmm. because heaven and earth are connected, because heaven and earth are connected in that community. And so when that community, when it's under the kingship of Jesus, renders a judgment heaven is aligned with it and stands with it. It's pretty amazing. I'm reminded of the fact, given that Peter means stone or rock, that he says in his epistle, 1 Peter chapter 2, we are living stones, Hmm. right? He's including himself there, but not just himself. We're all living stones that make up this temple, Ephesians chapter 2, that is being built up into a habitation of God himself. So all these things connect. I guess that's one of my big points is you start putting scripture together with scripture and you see who Peter is and then you fast forward to his letter and he's making comments that throw us back to Matthew 16. Yes, yes. It's all connected. It's all connected. And I just just wanna say a, a word about that reference to Daniel 7. That you, that you picked up on, the Son of Man. That's how Jesus starts this off, right? Mm-hmm. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Mm. That's the invitation. That's mm. the invitation to Peter and the rest of the disciples mm. to see who Jesus really is, to see that he is the one that all the nations are going to be left at his feet, that his mm. dominion is the everlasting Dominion. That's the that's the, that's the invitation to Peter to say, "Come on, Peter, just open your eyes a little bit more." My father's talking to you. My father's talking to you. Just, just take that step, and and he does. You know, he 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 yeah. he takes that step to move into that to mm. move into that confession. And I don't think that's I don't think that that's accidental because no. Jesus really the title that he gives himself the most is son of man it's it's about 102 times in the in the gospels Mm. so that opens the door for peter to really see jesus for who he is and of course the reality is is in the next chapter that's exactly what happens right they go up the mountain and they see jesus glorified yes yes the binding and the loosing the prohibiting and the permitting the unlocking and locking it's just fascinating that god has authorized fallen humans to speak in his name and not only to speak into his name but he has authorized the ecclesia to make decisions which commit god himself the god of heaven to act it's just incredible. I mean, the, the wording is clear. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. It's incredible. Another thing that strikes me is Jesus likes to give people nicknames. He gives Simon a nickname. Peter. We if call him Peter, but his real name is Simon, son of Jonah. So depending on whether you want it to be positive or negative, he's either rocky, you know, he's tough, he's rocky, or he's rockhead. He just doesn't get it. <laughs> or he's just a rock. <laughs> <laughs> he nicknamed James and John. They called them the Sons of Thunder. And we have this continuing in the early Ecclesia, where Barnabas is given the nickname Son of Encouragement or Son of Exhortation. Mm. I have given nicknames to people, not that I'm comparing myself to the Lord, <laughs> but, but I take my cues from him. You know, Jeffrey is Denzel, yeah. you're Timbo. <laughs> I think giving people nicknames is, finish that sentence for me. What is it? A sign of connection, a sign of affection, a sign of building community. Yeah, it is. 
It is. And it's fun, too. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> as long as the nickname isn't degrading. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a fun thing to do. And it's cool, too, because when I look at music bands, they often, the members of the band will often give nicknames to the members, you know. Not too long ago, I released, in February, the rewrite of the song Stairway to Heaven. Yeah, I Christ, saw that. I saw on, that. On the Christ is All podcast in February, and the lyrics have been changed to reflect the romance of the ages. Well, even in that band, the drummer, John Bonham, his nickname was Bonzo. And the lead guitarist, Jimmy Page, his nickname was Pagey. And John Paul Jones, the bassist, they called him Jonesy. And Robert Plant had a nickname. Robert Plant's nickname was Percy. So they all had nicknames for one another. I just use that as an illustration because I did notice how <laughs> Jesus gave nicknames to some of his disciples. I guess the last thing I want to say, Tim, and would love for your input on this, is that there is something here that really irritates me. And I've addressed this before, but you know, you can address something over and over again in writing, in speaking, messages, podcasts, but unless A, the people hearing it actually embrace it and take action on it, and B, enough people hear it and pass it on, then it doesn't change and people keep doing it. So the thing that irritates me is that when people say, well, you know, the kingdom is more important than the church because Jesus only mentioned the church twice, but he mentioned the kingdom lots and lots of times. And, of course, the two places where he uses ecclesia are the passages we've read, Matthew 16 and Matthew 18. Mm. Yes. All right. But here's the thing. It is a gross leap in logic to say, that because Jesus only used the term ecclesia twice in the Gospels, and by the way, he used it in line with the kingdom, the binding and the loosing, it's a faulty leap in logic to say that that then means the kingdom is more important than the church or the kingdom is separate from the church. First of all, as I have argued and made as plain as I could in the book Insurgents, you cannot separate the ecclesia from the kingdom of God. Hmm. The ecclesia is the community of the king. It is an incarnation of the kingdom, just as Jesus himself incarnates the king. And I won't go through the scriptural argument there. But the other thing is, every time you see Jesus talking to those 12 men and those seven women who are with him constantly, who are following him, who he's living in community with, and he talks to them and he uses the word you, Y-O-U, that is the ecclesia. Mm. That is the embryonic expression of the body of Christ. And count how many times he says you. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. Mm. You, 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 you. It's more than he uses the word kingdom. So... You have to put this in context. And to say that Jesus was more interested in the kingdom than he was the church, because he mentions kingdom so many more times than the actual word ecclesia, is like saying Paul wasn't terribly interested in discipleship, making disciples, or being a disciple, or helping disciples. Because he never, never uses the word disciple in his letters. Hmm. And he never uses the word discipleship. He uses the word believers. He uses the word holy ones. He uses those who are in Christ, but he never uses disciple. Well, guess what? Being a disciple and being a holy one and being in Christ and being a believer are the same thing. Hmm. And so it is with kingdom and ecclesia. What say you? I can I could be on that page, Frank. I could be on that page because the kingdom is embodied from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. The kingdom is embodied in Jesus of yes. Nazareth, yes. right? It's not an idea. Mm -hmm. It's not a philosophy. It's not a program. 
It's a person. Mm. When Jesus says, the kingdom is among you, Yes. It's because the kingdom is among them. The king is right the there. The king's right the there. Image. He's right there. He's embodying he's mm. embodying it. Mm. And so how is the king embodied on the planet now? Except through those of us who are the body of Christ. Yes. And what I what I like to say is the body of Christ, when we say the body of Christ, when Paul says the body of Christ It's not a metaphor. Right. It's beyond metaphor. That's right. Because Christ lives in us, and that is how the kingdom Mm -hmm. comes into the world. So I'm on that page with you, Frank. Amen. Before we close this episode out, there is one statement that Jesus made in this passage. But I would like to press upon everybody listening, and if you give this to a friend, who is not following the Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't know him, the question is, who do you say that I am? That's the issue. The issue is not, do you believe that Genesis chapters 1 and 2 are a literal literal rendering of creation? The issue is not, do you believe Adam was a real human being? The issue is not, do you believe that Jesus was black or Caucasian. The issue is not, do you believe in predestination or free will? The issue is, who is Jesus? Who is the Son of Man? Who do you say that I am? That's the issue. All the other things, they pale in comparison in terms of importance or significance. Who is Jesus of Nazareth in your eyes and in your heart? And we say with Peter, he is the Messiah, the King, the Lord of the world, the Savior. That's our testimony. That's our confession, which has come from Revelation. Who do you say that he is? And if you don't have an answer to that, we plead with you to move heaven and earth to discover who he is. And that question And the answer to it naturally leads to another question and another answer that the same person gave, Peter. Peter is the one who first recognized Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then post-resurrection, when Peter sees even more clearly who Jesus is, it's like you said before, Frank, this is not a doctrine. This is not an intellectual item to check off. This is a life transformation. This is a profound relationship and connection because Jesus says, Simon, do you love me? Mm. Do you love me more than these? Mm. And he's able to respond, Lord, you know that I love you. And that's where we end up. That's where the confession takes us. It doesn't leave us with some dogma. Mm. It leaves us in the presence of the living God who loves us. Mm. And who we love back by means of that same love that he loves us with. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I think we'll end it there. Um, We can probably spend another two or three hours just looking at this passage and bringing out various insights into it. And there are things we haven't seen. So if we were with other believers talking about this, we would probably add another two or three hours to that. But we'll end here, and we will see you in the next episode of the Insurgents Podcast. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the Insurgents Podcast and give it a five-star review on iTunes. This will help others find it. Also, you can join Frank's unfiltered email list at frankviola.org and receive encouragement, challenges, and insights connected to the gospel of the kingdom. Remember, the insurgence has begun. Don't miss it.